All right, so hi, my name is Matthew Brown. I'm uh, the coordinator for the Comics and Popular Arts Conference. What that is, is a peer-reviewed <coughs> academic conference that uh, takes in submissions and uh, constructs panels and offers them to the tracks at DragonCon. So um, what you're gonna see, there are four experts here on the, on the panel, the two of them are gonna be giving academic presentations um, uh, based on their own uh, research. Um, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves uh, real quick, and then we will uh, we'll go into the first presentation. I'll ask you to hold questions till the end after the presentations are over. So, Andy, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, on behalf of myself and Pete, who are academics and who are used to the panel outnumbering the audience at presentations, this mm -hmm. is truly weird. I want to mm -hmm. thank you for all for being here. Uh, I'm a professor of digital rhetoric at Westchester University at, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, my name is Pete Rohrbaugh. I'm an assistant professor in the English department at Kennesaw State University, just north of Atlanta. Okay. And my name is Mika McKinnon. I am a disaster scientist and geophysicist, but more relevant for this particular panel is I am a science consultant in the entertainment industry. So if you ever watch Stargate, you know my handwriting extremely well. Uh, more recent things are I worked on Star Trek Discovery, uh, Madam Secretary, No Tomorrow, which is a romantic comedy about the end of the world. I'm currently um, under uh, some limitations on being able to talk about superhero movies and comic movies <laughs> for reasons that will become apparent in future Dragon Cons. Uh, I may or may not have worked on Sharknado, and I honestly don't know, which tells you a lot about how the film industry operates. Okay. All right. So uh, we will start with uh, Andy Famicletti. Hi, everybody. So, um, like I said, I'm a, a professor of digital rhetoric. Uh, I was trained by folks who worked in legal studies and, uh, and anthropology and sociology. So, when Matt asked me to be part of the pop culture conference, I was like, oh, yeah, culture. I know culture, right? That's, you know, like all of these ideas that uh, people hold in common and they, they sort of uh, talk about amongst themselves. And then I, you know, put this presentation together. I was like, oh, there's a lot of culture in here. That's good. Uh, and then I realized I was supposed to be popular culture. Uh, so there, it's a little light on that, if I'm honest. Uh, I'm just going to riff really hard on the two pieces I, I do have. Um, if you know Cory Doctorow, don't rat me out to him. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk about basically uh, this. Um, I want to unpack, uh, sort of explore an idea that I think occurs in the open and free culture movements and the larger kind of open internet movement of the early 2000s, right, a, a long time ago now. Um, and uh, it's mostly this idea that, uh, that sort of holds that if we can just connect uh, human minds to the distributed open technology that is the internet, then we will almost automatically uh, create a form of abundance, right, a form of uh, sort of creativity, which will then in itself relieve some of the forms of scarcity, right, of, uh, of material limitation that have traditionally led to um, control, right, various forms of unfreedom, right? There's a sort of thesis running through uh, some of these thinkers that holds that, okay, if, right, scarcity, especially property-based scarcity, but also, right, sort of, uh, sort of government, if those controls are there to manage scarcity, uh, then if we can get rid of the scarcity, we get rid of the control, everybody gets more free. Um, so I want to sort of unpack that idea, show how it runs through uh, a few different thinkers. Um, then I want to uh, complicate it, which for those of you who are not academics, that means sort of crap all over it, uh, and, uh, and say why, right, from the point of view we have now in 2018, maybe that that idea, as, as brilliant and hopeful as it was, and I remember being brilliant and hopeful about that idea in 2004, and it was super fun, uh, and why, right, that may have been our last best hope for a new political economy, but to quote Babylon 5, it failed. Um, and what what now, right, where do we go? How does, how does this uh, happen? Spoiler, I don't know. Um, so, right, to, to start out, here's my one bit of popular culture, right? The blogger, infamous cape wearer, uh, and science fiction author, right, Cory Doctorow, in a, an interview with Are You Serious, um, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, kind of gave this quote, right, 
where he talked about the idea of uh, of the open internet and of sort of uh, these sort of distributed technologies as being almost like uh, um, magical self-regenerating commons, right? Uh, he says it's not hard to think about a sort of nanotech future, right? And and nanotech, I think, gets invoked here in the same way that nanotech usually gets invoked, right? As a as a form, basically, of magic, uh, not unlike wizardry or the blockchain, um, where, right? Like, okay, if we just have this thing, then all these other problems can be taken care of. Uh, magic future, where virtually all objects are available on demand, in that kind of world, both the traditional Marxist and the traditional Keynesian analysis don't make a lot of sense, right? So we're saying, okay, if we have all this stuff, right? That's just generated by uh, by assemblers or uh, by star uh, Stargate's replicators. I know those are bad guys, but like imagine they were good guys. Uh, or Charlie Strauss's uh, uh, cornucopia machines from Singularity Sky. Then, okay, right? Scarcity is relieved, and we don't have to worry about the sorts of regulatory schemes that either a uh, state-based uh, communist society or our traditional market-based uh, liberal society right, sort of puts in place. Um, this don't make a lot of sense. Uh, these are predicated first and foremost on the regulation of scarce and valuable objects. In a Kazaa world, right? For those of you who remember Kazaa, right? It was a peer-to-peer -peer networking platform uh, where every time someone expresses a material si market signal about the value of a song without a copy of it, instead of there being one fewer copies of that song, now there's more one copy of that song. This is a really different economic proposition, right? And I talk about this as an alternative to the tragedy of the commons. This is a commons where the sheep shit grass, right? So. In the early part of the 21st century, right, as these peer-to-peer -peer sharing networks emerge, it becomes apparent that they do this weird thing, right, when you compare them to a centralized, and this is the EFF track, I know you guys already know this, but I'm going to say it anyway, right, compared to centralized distribution systems where if you plug in more, right, receivers, you put more load on your central distributor. If each of your receivers is a transceiver, if it's also going to make copies and forward them onto the rest of your distributed network, every user of that network makes the network work stronger, right? It's this weird property where rather than consuming the network, you build it as you go. Um, and there's this thought, right, that if only we could figure out the technological manner in which to replicate that, spread that throughout the rest of the economy, whether that was the 3D printer, right? Folks were really excited about those, right? They wanted to call them, uh, right, name them after the Star Trek replicator, right? That this is going to beam your Earl Grey tea right into your house. Uh, in fact, you can almost make a lawn ornament with most of them. Um, and so, right, there's this desire, right, to create this automatic, this technologically determinist abundance um, because if you can do that, then things like property, which is a drag, and things like bureaucracy, which is a drag, right, we can start to pull those things back. And I think that unleashes some really creative, really interesting ideas about uh, anti-property or non-property that I'm certainly not interested in, in saying we're no good or shouldn't have been thought about, but maybe have, we're a little bit over-enthusiastic about what they might do. Uh, another thinker of the moment, right, Richard Stallman, who also needs no introduction, uh, right, who was uh, the, right, the founder of the Free Software Foundation, um, who worked on the, the first open software license, right, the GNU, the GNU uh, GPL, um, kind of made the connection between uh, sort of scarcity and control and property uh, in this little analogy from one of his essays, right, where he says, uh, consider a space station where air must be manufactured at great cost, charging each breather, right, a per liter of air may be fair, and he's sort of, this is his analogy to write, like, charging people by the song or charging people by the copy of software, right, if they're sort of equivalent of charging you by the liter of air. Um, it'd be fair, but wearing the metered gas masks all day and all night is intolerable, even if everyone can afford to pay the air bill, and the TV cameras everywhere to see that you never take the mask off are outrageous, right? So he's saying, okay, if we want to create scarcity in this world of what ought to be natural abundance, we have to put into place these, right, DRM systems, these uh, sort of technological locks that are, right, or even more advanced systems of surveillance of con and control, uh, and that <laughs> right that ought to dissuade us from doing this, um, even right even if it were a fair price. Um, of course, what's interesting here, right, is that Stallman, at least in this essay, kind of throws off the idea of uh, of sort of a a 
per head charge for uh, for creative and cultural uh, kind of uh, kind of activity. Uh, it's better to support the air plant with a head tax and chuck the masks, right? That would be equivalent of the idea that was floated repeatedly in uh, the early part of the last uh, last decade of trying to assign some sort of tax on electronic devices, right? You buy a computer, you pay a small tax, that tax goes into a kitty somewhere, and everybody who writes music gets money out of that kitty based on, right, that tax. The same way the BBC, right, taxes, televisions, radios, things like that in uh, the United Kingdom, puts that fund back into content creation. Uh, of course, that never happened. Um, and one of the reasons that it never happened uh, was there was an emerging idea at about the same time that said you actually didn't need that to happen because the means for creating all that stuff maybe didn't have to be paid for. Um, Clay Shirky, uh, who wrote the sort of uh, famous kind of a very early take on organizing without organizations, here comes everybody, um, says in his uh, really sort of fun and, and provocative, but kind of maybe wrong, uh, sort of piece, Gin, Television, and the Cognitive Surplus, right? He, he recounts this uh, event where he was talking with a TV producer, um, he's talking to her about um, sort of this emerging economy of people doing stuff on the internet, um, and she says he, she, he says she hears this story, right? She shook her head and she says, "Where do people find the time?" Right? That was her question, and I just kind of stopped and I said, right, very indignant here. Uh, no one who gets, works in TV gets to ask that question. You know where the time comes from? It comes from the cognitive surplus you've been masking for the past 50 years, right? So Shirky kind of puts out this idea that television is and popular culture in a in a consume only, a read only mode, as it were, is this kind of cognitive heat sink. It's taking all of this human mental energy and it's just using it up, watching Gilligan try to escape the island over and over and over again. Um, that's Shirky's analogy, not mine. He's a pretty funny guy. Um, and, right, he does this back of the envelope calculation. He says, well, if we took like 1% of all the time that people spend watching television and we, you know, devote it instead to making peer to peer projects, uh, he works out, I can't remember what his back of the envelope calculation was, like uh, 10 Wikipedias a year, right? 1,000 Wikipedias a year, right? He uses Wikipedia as his sort of uh, his sort of unit of measure, right? How many hours it takes to write a Wikipedia, at least in the state Wikipedia was in, in uh, 2004. Um, and you could just do that over and over and over again. Uh, of course, in the intervening 11 year, no, 14 years, oh, I'm so old. Uh, there have not been any further Wikipedias. There's just Wikipedia. Um, so the, um, the idea, right, that Turkey kind of throws out here, that there is this cognitive surplus, that we're going to unleash all this extra human creativity just by pe putting people into this distributed kind of read-write communications technology um, gets kind of uh, more, um, more rigorously explored and kind of laid out by, uh, by the sort of cultural theorists slash uh, so it's economist Yerche Benkler, uh, whose wealth of networks, right, lays out what he calls a, a theory of peer production, right? That if we have uh, folks who have the capability to work on Wikipedia or open source software or folding at home or, right, any number of, uh, of other sorts of free open projects, um, that this will lead to kind of greater autonomy, greater, uh, greater productivity, and that there wouldn't be a need for the sort of tax that Stallman throws out in his, uh, in his imagined space station analogy, because instead of, right, paying people to create, we allow them to create, right, and we get all this, uh, this extra stuff, we get this abundance, right, this commons uh, where the sheep shit grass, right, where our servers shit music or Wikipedias. Um, and, right, for Bankler, that's really important, not just because it's abundance, but because it also represents uh, an important step forward for personal autonomy and freedom, right? It says, uh, the merge of the networked information economy has the potential to in increase individual autonomy. First, it increases the range and diversity of things individuals can do for and by themselves, right? So instead of having to uh, rely on the folks at Britannica, right, to write you an encyclopedia, you can write your own darn encyclopedia. Instead of having to rely on, right, this big distant power structure uh, to figure out, right, any number of things, you can come together with your neighbors and you can, right, do it for yourself. 
Um, uh, it does this by uh, lifting, for one, the, uh, for one important domain of life, some of the central material constraints, what individuals can do that typify the industrial information economy, right? The majority of tools and platforms necessary for effective action in the, inf in the information environment are in the hands of most individuals in advanced economies, right? This was before even the smartphone, right? Benkler's saying, okay, if you have a laptop, you have a TV studio, you have a radio station, right? You have a, a printing press, you have all of these things that traditionally were, right, the means of information production. Um, and so there's a line then, right, from imagined nanotechnology abundance to the internet as really existing uh, sort of abundance via freedom, right? If you set people free to create, they'll create all this free stuff which then relieves us from having to exercise control over property, right? That means by definition limiting people's freedom. Um, so there's this really kind of interesting, right? Sort of hopeful moment uh, in the middle of the last decade where uh, we thought that was gonna work. Uh, here's why, in my opinion, it is not. Um, first, while Benkler and Shirky and others wanna talk about free labor as this uh, sort of limitless resource, right? Like air, like water, just turn on the internet and it flows back up into uh, various different projects. Um, it, it's not really so. When we look at actual um, open source projects like Wikipedia, we find that, um, that participants in those projects treat their labor as very scarce, very precious. Uh, in my research on Wikipedia, I found that Wikipedia editors uh, treated the, the way in which you can protect a Wikipedia article and prevent it from being edited as a, uh, an important mechanism for protecting their right hard work on an article, preventing it from being vandalized. Um, uh, we know, right, from quantitative studies of Wikipedia that there is a life cycle for Wikipedia editors, right? They join the project, they contribute at a very high rate for a while, and then they tend to burn out over a period of months or years, uh, which means that Wikipedia needs to uh, recruit new editors to replace their burning out old editors. And in fact, they have not been able to maintain that recruitment process since about 2007. So for about the last 11 years, right, participation in Wikipedia has slowly been declining. Of course, that's uh, in part maybe just part of the natural life cycle of a project like that, right? The, the project has five million articles right now. There's not as much to do. Um, but at the same time, right, uh, Wikipedia has been trying really hard to recruit new editors into, uh, into the labor pool. Uh, and they've been struggling with that. Um, and as I kind of, uh, kind of lay out in a forthcoming publication, uh, if you look at the actual history of when Wikipedia started in 2001, what you have is not a sort of, oh, we're out of time, sorry, uh, sort of uh, magic pool of everybody. You have a pool of uh, a handful of, um, or not a handful, but a fairly large number of, uh, of unemployed tech folks from the dot-com bust, right? And they're kind of looking for something to, uh, to work on, they're looking for something to invest in that can't be propertized and taken away from them when a company folds and they get involved in Wikipedia. Uh, two, if labor is scarce, then freedom is rivalrous, right? As we see on Twitter, some folks exercising their free speech uh, tend to chill out other folks, right, and uh, and make them feel uncomfortable on their platforms. Uh, this happens in particular uh, surrounding uh, surrounding women and people of color who express uh, any number of different opinions on Twitter, right, face these really ugly uh, sort of hate speech uh, kind of uh, kind of backlash. Um, and this means, right, that we can't just set everybody free and their freedom is going to just coexist. We have to acknowledge that freedom is rivalrous, right? That there's uh, there's some conflict, right, to folks exercising their freedom of speech and other people existing on the platform, and we have to figure out what to do with that. And that probably means some sort of uh, some sort of control, limitation, guidelines, right? rules, uh, and we're going to have to figure out what those mean, and we're still not figuring that out, right? Twitter, in particular, is not figuring that out. Uh, there was, I don't know if you see that joke there, right? They were said that now it's a faster way to report abuse. Download this image and email it to yourself, right? And just email yourself that we reviewed these complaints and there's nothing we can do, image. Uh, and then finally, I'm, I'm 
Almost done, I promise. Uh, some coordination may require control, right? We, we don't like control. We want to set people free to do their own stuff. But Zainab Tufekci in particular uh, has found in her Twitter and tear gas um, that one of the things that can happen when you have these broad distributed movements is they can get going really quickly, but they can't change direction. Uh, they can't change tactics. They can't uh, switch up what they're doing in response to opposition because there's no central point of control to be like, hey, you guys with the drum circle, stop, you're ruining Occupy. Uh, um, and so, right, this sort of, right, this sort of central, right, coordination <coughs> point is, while it upset people and it has real limitations, without it, uh, there seem to be some things that these movements struggle to do. Um, Zayn actually says that way better than me. Get Twitter and tear gas, it's awesome, just read it. Um, and, right, so what now is I like to tell my students, like my students tend to join my classes and they're like, you're an expert, you know what to do. I'm like, no, I'm here to tell you that no experts know what to do. Like we're screwed, figure this out. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of my, my big takeaway. Like we've got these complications, we don't know what to do with them yet. Uh, but my three brief thoughts were, we're gonna think less about freedom and probably more about justice. That's a hard conversation to have. Uh, we may have to embrace the boring. Right? So many folks wanted to only do uh, interesting things and they didn't want to wait in line in the DMV or have rules or like kind of go to committee meetings. It's probably gonna have to be a lot of those. Uh, and be prepared to feel uncomfortable, right? If, if freedom is, uh, is rivalrous, those of us, especially with privilege, may have to feel a little less comfortable, a little less free in order for us to have uh, a more just environment. Um, so thank you and I'm sorry for going over time. All right, thanks Andy. Um, I'm gonna run through kind of a different view of, of, of these things. Andy's um, kind of theoretical um, presentation is different from, from mine, which is more methodological. So I wanna talk about how as uh, somebody who began a career as a, a pretty simply a writing teacher, that I've been influenced by um, open source culture, open source projects, and open source methodologies. And I've been able to pull those into um, uh, teaching environments that I'm working in and that I see other people doing the same thing. Uh, this is exciting to me because what I get to do is kind of boil all of the things that I like off of the top of the scary fermented brew that Andy just um, put together and then deploy them. So that's what I'm going to... take that as a compliment. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so uh, I did begin my career as a writing teacher um, in high school, and then uh, so I taught high school for four or five years before I started a PhD. Um, and around about the time that I finished my PhD, I kind of pivoted away from a bunch of traditional writing that I was doing on late 20th century American novels and just started studying the internet. I'm really curious about the kinds of practices that the internet, um, that, that uh, distributed communities uh, in, um, build together and how kind of protocols are, are groups of people build protocols and uh, the human, kind of the human side of the web more than the technical side. And uh, so that's, for me, that's developed into kind of four distinct but overlapping interest fields. Uh, so in writing classes, I'm mostly talking about composing for the web. I'm talking about web literacy, new media citizenship, and digital storytelling. Um, and uh, one, you know, th this is an example of the, the blog that I use to, um, to push whatever we're doing in the class. Um, and uh, I'll come back to this example in a minute, but most of the time I'm trying to move students into a space where they own their own kind of space on the web. So talking about self-hosted domains and people kind of um, owning their own place rather than using the resources that the university is giving them or Facebook or whatever, I want them to kind of carve out their own territory and operate and publish and write from that space. Um, and so I'm, I'm modeling that a lot of times with uh, the way that I'm promoting resources to the class. Um, mostly I want to talk about how open source culture and methodology has influenced how I teach research, uh, how I teach collaboration, and how I teach publication. Wrong computer. Uh, so in terms of sources or research, um, I, I think it's really important to introduce to students quickly the idea that even though they've grown up for most of their, um, most of their time in front of a computer with the idea that if you can right click it, that means that you own it. 
Um, I, I want to I really dispel that idea, mostly because um, as students are moving kind of through the trajectory of their college career, they're, they're kind of leaving the space where they're mostly just reading and consuming, and hopefully they're moving into the space where they're producing and collaborating and making things. And when you start making things, you realize, wow, these rules about how people can use the stuff that I make are really important to me now. Before I was just recycling other people's stuff, but now I'm making stuff and I want to think ethically uh, and maybe more critically about how people are going to use my stuff and how I'm going to use other people's stuff. Um, and so as, as we're moving into a digital composing space, I want to introduce the idea of the creative, of creative Commons licenses to students right away and, and kind of explain the differences between um, a, an image or any piece of media that's in the public domain or licensed under Creative Commons or owned by a company and sitting under traditional copyright protections or owned by the student herself. Um, those kind of four um, uh, categories are how I start to talk about um, media that, that students are going to put together, stitch together, or share as part of their research. And um, talking kind of in a granular way about how a Creative Commons license, the four different kinds of Creative Commons licenses break down, and how people can kind of start wrapping their mind around how when you slap a Creative Commons license on something, you are essentially asking or inviting people to use it, but to use it in a critical, conscious, ethical way, rather than retreating to the kind of entrenched position of copyright and saying, don't you dare touch my thing, um, and if you do, then we'll end up in court, maybe. Uh, and, and students are, are, are prone to thinking that nobody's ever going to come after them. If they pull that Deadpool um, movie poster, you know, uh, GIF and, and put it somewhere on their project, and they're right, nobody's going to come chasing them for that money. Nobody's going to come, like, uh, suing them when they're in a, a digital rhetoric class in their junior year. But when they graduate and they go on to be a, become a content creator somewhere, potentially that line gets blurred. They're going to forget what are the rules about this stuff? And I want them kind of learning and practicing an ethical, um, an ethical or, or demonstrating an ethical practice early on so that they continue that out into their careers. Um, so in terms of uh, talking about sources and using sources in creative projects, um, I'm pushing people towards Creative Commons licensing and that to me comes out of kind of open source culture initiatives or ideology. Um, and, and I'll talk briefly here about collaboration. Um, we talk, we've been talking in education the whole time that I've been a scholar or, or a teacher about how important collaboration is, um, but when you start talking about collaboration to undergraduates, a lot of times their eyes glaze over because the only thing that collaboration means to them is what? Group work. Group work. Jeez, don't, please don't put me in a group. Um, because that means that I'm either going to have to do everything or I'm going to get to do nothing. And um, I'm going to quickly suss that out and then decide which box I'm going to sit in. Uh, and so, we, but we don't, but we see that there are plenty of communities of people that do digital work that don't default to one of those two states. Uh, and people that are working on things that are, uh, that are exciting and that they, like Andy's talking about, but when people work on something like a Wikipedia article where they're willing to invest energy in it because they understand what the kind of levels of work are going to be, who's going to do what, how that work is going to be respected or protected, um, and how they're going to be able to add on to work that other people have done. So um, collaborative projects are not the only thing that, I, uh, that we do in the classes that I teach, but they're a big part because what I'm, mostly what I want people to learn is how to collaborate not just to work in a group, but to look at a group and decide what skills do I bring to this group and how can I kind of cut out that job and define that job really quickly to the group so that the group is, so that I'm accountable to that job and I know what jobs the other people are accountable to. And this is a thing that I think really good digital communities do when they work on things like coding. Um, and so this is an example of how, even though I'm not a programming person, I'm not a coder by any stretch, but studying how people write about um, open source culture or um, agile web, web development or those kinds of things, when I read that stuff, I immediately see parallels to writing because when people are coding, essentially they're also writing. So I want writers to kind of think about building media or building research components or whatever in the same way that really effective, respectful, ethical communities build coded projects. Um, these are some kind of quick uh, um, 
clips or, or quotes from this, uh, this resource called the Short Guide to Digital Humanities. If you've not heard of the Digital Humanities before, it's a really complicated, interesting, long, you could talk about that for a long time, what the Digital Humanities is or isn't, but basically it's scholars who are working inside of humanities fields who are also engaging their work in some way with the internet. Um, and they're, and they're in reflecting on and, uh, the, the effect of the internet on their work and their students' work. Uh, this is an example of the short guide to the digital humanities and how they talk about uh, teams and collaboration and project management. Um, and this is their, uh, this is a, a brief quote about how they talk about open source software and how inside the digital humanities community they promote the idea of using open source platforms and tools and initiatives because it teaches a kind of um, sharing or a kind of um, uh, information orientation or data orientation that is useful for, um, for learning. This is a brief example of how this translates into, uh, into a class uh, more simply. Uh, when I teach um, freshman writing classes, uh, I describe very quickly how the work that they're going to do in that class is going to be different from a traditional English class. It's not going to be paper, paper, paper. It's going to be uh, you're going to write a blog cycle. You're going to rhetorically analyze something. You're going to make an argument um, out of a bunch of images. And you're going to do a collaborative bibliography. And so the, the way that that works out eventually is that I have this chart. This is an ex like a picture from a Google spreadsheet that I'll use. And I'll define a handful of dates, usually 15 due dates all over the map for the course of the semester. And I ask people to sign up for when they want to turn something in. It's up to them. There's only like a limited number of blo box, boxes for each due date. But what this means is that everybody is going through the course at a different, um, at a different uh, path. It's not linear. Everybody's doing these things in a different order. And when they finish them, their name on the chart becomes a link to the work that they've done. So everybody can look over the course of the semester at the work that other people have done. So if you're turning in your blog cycle at the end of the semester, you have the benefit of looking at what everybody else, the blog cycle projects that people have done over the course of the semester. If you're turning in your blog cycle assignment at the end of the semester, yours should probably be better. Because you've looked at all of that stuff. You've grown through re uh, reading and talking about all that stuff through the class. Um, another important component of this is the idea of iteration. The fact that students should be able to do something and watch how other people have talked about it and come back and redo it. Uh, when somebody does the image argument in the first two or three weeks of school, um, they shouldn't be confined to that version of the image argument. If they see other people do making that argument later in the semester in ways that they think are interesting, they should be able to come back and iterate on that argument that they made. Um, and so this is a, this is a nonlinear kind of choose your own assignment pathway through the semester um, that I think comes from um, the idea that, that looking at other people's work and talking about that work impacts your own. Um, lastly, to talk about publications, I've talked about uh, research and sources and collaboration. Um, I want to talk quickly about publication. I gestured toward this in the beginning. Uh, I really want to stress to students who are going to be doing any kind of writing or content creating in digital spaces that it's good for them to know how to own their stuff. I want them to understand what owning their own domain looks like what putting software that they've chosen to put on that domain looks like. Usually they begin with something open source like WordPress. And publishing from that space, if they want to share that stuff in a social media environment or they want to put it into some kind of like cycle where there's a network, that's great. But ultimately it originates from them. They own the space first. Um, so that I'm trying to move people away from the idea that if you're going to do a blog assignment, you, you should think really, you know, critically about how if you the first thing that you do is open up a wordpress.com page you're essentially saying I'm getting ready to write a web page over and over and over that wordpress can put uh, that wordpress.com can put advertisements on whereas if they open up their own space they can't uh, if they want to eventually monetize that space if they have 5,000 beanie babies in their basement and they want to use that web space eventually to sell all of that stuff use their own site to to advertise that uh, or to to build their own advertisements rather than just building content that somebody else can advertise upon um, this, uh, this is the home page of Reclaim Hosting, which is a, a web hosting service that um, uh, run by some, some friends and colleagues that we have at, that began their career at University of Mary Washington. Now they've kind of left that academic environment. They're just running Reclaim. But this is a space where, um, uh, where we, this is a company that sells web hosting and name domain registration to mostly to students and teachers who are going to use them in classroom environments. But it's open to anyone to use. 
Um, it's super cheap. Um, there's a DIY aesthetic so that when you, you know, like going through Reclaim is a little bit different from going through something like Bluehost or HostGator where um, you get a lot for that, but getting to that a lot is kind of complicated. Uh, the customer service component of Reclaim is really amazing. And um, beyond just teaching people how to drop WordPress onto a domain that they own and moving on, you can see at the bottom here, part of the Reclaim hosting kind of apparatus is that it gives the student or the user access to Installatron, which is this um, catalog of over 100 different open source applications that people can just play with. So you want to drop Scalar or Omeka or you want to play with Drupal, you can continue to kind of divide your um, the domain that you own on Reclaim into, into subdivided spaces and you can start dropping those programs in and playing with them. And sometimes in a new media class, I'll have students just try stuff out, um, try that kind of open source material out. Um, these are some of, the, some of the places where I grab. So the Creative Commons image comes from Creative Commons. The Reclaim Hosting image comes from Reclaim Hosting. The Short Guide to Digital Humanities um, uh, is written by those authors. I'd be glad to share that with anyone, although you can be glad to search it on the web and find it. Uh, but also, um, I try to stress to students when I build projects like this, if I'm going to include an image like this or this, it's usually an image that I take. So I want students thinking about like how the lives that they're doing where they walk around and take pictures and find things interesting can be kind of wedded together with their idea of what they want to study. Um, and the idea that this picture that I took while I was in Poland at a, um, at a museum um, you know, three years ago has nothing necessarily to do with open methodologies. But when I go looking through my pictures and I want to talk about something that's open and curious and weird and kind of building in, in strange ways, this picture just speaks to me. Um, it's easy for me. I have no ethical qualms about using my own picture to do that, rather than try and find, uh, grab somebody else's picture, which is maybe design perfect, but not owned by the student. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick capture of three ways that I try to incorporate open source, open, open source culture and tools and methodologies in the classes that I'm teaching, writing classes that I'm teaching. Thanks. All right. So since we're at Dragon Con and it is a pop culture convention, I'm going to haul us back into the world of pop culture for starting off our panel <laughs> discussion over here. Uh, so I, I, once upon a time, actually used to teach a class on practical science fiction, uh, during which I would always include a short story from Spider Robinson called Melancholy Elephants, which is, as far as I know, the only sci-fi that directly addresses the issue of copyright creep and that Mickey Mouse will be under copyright forever, and its psychological impact on content creators, who, that there's this concept of a limited number of, of creative expressions in the universe, and what happens when all of them are under copyright. Can you think of any other uh, pop culture works that actually directly address the concept of, yeah, you're nodding, go yeah, ahead, yeah. talk, I mean, it's I a mean, panel discussion, yeah, no, it's uh, not uh, my I mean, turn Doctoro, all of it. Um, but especially like, oh uh, God, there's the, oh, uh, uh, there's iRobot, uh, and then there's the, what was the one where there's like kids and they're trying to jailbreak their textbooks? A lot of Cory Doctorow. Um, Charlie Strauss, I think, uh, frequently kind of gets into uh, some of that intellectual property stuff, especially like Celerando, right? Um, so we actually have to explain what these things are right. as we're going through, because not everybody yeah, has read so everything. Charlie Strauss's Accelerando <laughs> is, uh, is basically this fun little novel where AI eats the solar system. Um, and one of the plot lines early on, it's like in these like phases as time goes by and uh, robots eat the solar system more and more. And in the early phases, it's like the protagonist against the RIAA, like as part of his right big, uh, big kind of dramatic tension there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think especially in, you know, the, the previous decade, right, 2000, 2010, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in, in copyright and intellectual property as, yeah, as a, a conceit for, um, for science fiction authors. Um, who else? Ah. I'm actually kind of thinking that, so the, the early hackers movies, like literally like hackers yeah. and sneakers and all of that, they get into this whole concept of the hacker's manifesto of information mm -hmm. wants to be free, my only crime is curiosity, 
you'd end up with all of these plot points that would end up of like hack the planet and release information into the world there's giant conspiracies to keep it trapped and i kind of feel like that era of of plot line is kind of ending because now we're seeing in real life we're starting to see the ugly side of that of like mm. the mob mentality the doxing the 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 ways that is used to intimidate to bully to abuse mm. and now we're getting different stories where the stories now are about keeping information about mm. trying to preserve and pull things apart yeah and i mean uh i mean the expanse right that's kind of the expanse kind of plays with that um with uh what's his face the right the captain character is kind of WikiLeaks-esque decision, right, to leak all the information about the supposed Martian stealth spaceships, and then he's wrong, and then he has to leak it again. Um, and I do think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, if we had been talking 10 years ago and, and WikiLeaks had come up, we'd be like, oh, yeah, WikiLeaks are really cool. They're kind of government watchdogs. And now it's like they're maybe ethno supremacists, maybe. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like the kind of the mood around these things have, has changed and also it's sort of like remember when the worst thing we had to worry about was copyright that was great um so <laughs> and i'm canadian so we of course have been like on the u.s watch list for being some of the biggest copyright infringers on the planet because we're like hey cool it's fine it's totally legal to download anything you want as long as you don't upload it so we just pay a tax on like all our storage media instead. Uh, another shift I've seen is like the the original open internet concept was a lot about there's that everything has equal platform that there's no differentiation between what is true and what is false. Like that was part of the point. And now we're hitting a point where we're like, oh, oh, wait a minute, fake news is actually a problem. Yeah. And like botnets of of spreading ideas and dealing with the fact that it turns out humans are really, really easy to influence and have a lot of cognitive biases. Oh no, this is actually an issue that's causing serious detri detrimental impacts in our societies. It's like, again, I think starting to change in the stories that we're telling. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to give openings here to get into <laughs> pop culture. You're allowed to say things. I don't need to monologue. I'd like... What do you do about it? That's the question. Well, yeah, and that's like... An, so... Uh, yeah. So, the thing I didn't say in my earlier hats is that when I went to grad school, uh, I was in the geosciences department doing disasters. And you're like, cool, earth, rocks, that has nothing to do with culture. Except for we were physically next door to the psychology department. <laughs> and if you know anything about grad students, you know that free food has a very strong gravitational pull. <laughs> And the lab that was closest to mine, Fluid Dynamics and Doom, was uh, cognition and culture, specifically how does culture propagate. So did not technically study this, just spent a lot of free lunches with the people who did. <laughs> and was occasionally one of their research victims uh, or helped put together their, like, their little videos where you're trying to influence small children. Um, it's not evil. Um, uh, just teaching them useless words. Uh, so when you start talking about wh how, how do you shape culture, at its most fundamental, humans are driven by curiosity. We need to learn absolutely everything about the entire universe, starting with what are fingers and toes, moving up to shadows are deep, dark, and if you hit them, you fall over, and then continuing on from there. But we've developed a hack around this which is we don't need to learn everything. Instead, we tell stories to each other in order to learn things. And humans aren't unique in this. Like, crows will teach each other stories. Uh, the toothed whales tell each other stories. Quite a few of the primate species tell stories. So there are other, other species that have culture to some extent or another. But it is one of the more powerful aspects of being human is that we can shortchange around, I don't need to learn everything, I just need to learn through storytelling. Where this gets really cool is that then you can start influencing culture by the stories we tell. That this is a, it's not a one-way path. The stories we tell are influenced by the cultures we're in and the futures we're dreaming of, and the futures we build are influenced by the stories we've been telling. There's, there's obvious concrete versions of this in like flip phones and Star Trek communicators, um, but there's also more subtle ones like uh, Gattaca was talking about the dystopia of having all genetic information known, and now we're starting to actually see the ramifications of having handed over our genetic codes to private for-profit companies and signed over data releases where they can do whatever they want with it. Um, 
So we're starting to, to see those things, and then we can start using stories to influence those. So part of why I work in science consulting is because I'm not going to successfully convince everybody to take science classes. A lot of people have had the terrible experiences for other various cultural and sociological reasons uh, where they think they hate science now um, and that they've had the curiosity driven out of them. But they still like consuming media. And if people are going to consume media and consume stories, you can slip in lessons. You can slip in science. You can slip in the practice of science. The idea of you go out and you have questions and you observe and you learn. And when you see something that contradicts your ideas, you change your mind to suit new data. Is like that's fundamentally the practice of science, and that's also a thing we see in a lot of characters in their like big story arc. Is they think a thing and then they discover they're wrong and they change and do something different. Like that's a classic story arc going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, that's not the only reason we tell stories, right? We tell stories not just to to learn things, but also to express who we are and what communities we belong to and how we think about those communities. Um, and the tricky thing about that is that when people read stories, right, they don't just decipher a message that was sent to them by the storyteller, right? They make up their own message, right, as they read. Uh, the, the philosopher and cultural theorist Stuart Hall, right, talked about this in his essay, Encoding, Decoding, where he talks about how people can decode a message and, and take away the kind of literal meaning, or they can decode it in a resistive way, right? They can find some new meaning that they want and take that out of the text. And when he was writing in the 50s and 60s, that was a really hopeful message. He was saying, oh, we could take stories that are out there that are homophobic or that are racist or that are sexist, and we can decode them another way and find ways to be more open to these different identity groups. But one of the things I think we've discovered lately is that we can also find communities that take really hopeful, interesting stories like the ones you're talking about, and they read them all wrong. Uh, well, I think, in I think that saying it's a judgment call no, if they read no. them wrong is unfair. It's again, well, you don't I'm, have a one-way path. It's yes. never a one-way path. All and I'm if saying you think is it's it is, not, you're yeah, not it's gonna... Never, it's never going to be as simple as we can shape the culture by shaping the stories because even if we shape the stories, the readers of those stories will then reshape them themselves. Uh, and so the the... The and that's ground a good thing. We're kind of, it is a good thing. It would be like uh, really depressing thing. if we could go forth and be like, and everyone will think the same right. thing. Right. I well, have dictated your culture to you. It's mine now. That. Yeah, we wouldn't want that either. But right, but human beings have been doing that for a long, long time, like way longer than they have been like m interpreting things in multiple ways. Like the the thing that Mika that you're saying that rem that makes me think about stuff that w that I've done with students is that uh, we always have this black mirror conversation at the beginning of every semester black mirror eventually shows up and then everybody has to deal with how much exposure they have to black mirror and how it scarred their life and how <laughs> that weekend that they spent binging the whole thing and then they walked out and they couldn't talk to anybody or love anybody again because <laughs> just completely over and and all like I want all of that to exist I think that those are important <laughs> responses to black mirror but I also want to put a reading on on top of, or suggest a reading on top of all that Black Mirror stuff that actually Black Mirror can be super hopeful because when you look at Black Mirror and you realize how close we are to that narrative, like how we're just, you know, 10 years or 15 years or one pro pro program development away from this episode or that episode, you realize that Charlie Brooker actually like wants us to change. Like we can actually intervene. We don't have to have the episode where all the bees go up your nose and you know like kill you we don't have to have the episode where the person is just set to run over and over and over and you know have their mind wiped and live their you know vengeance everybody lives their vengeance on that person like we don't have to do that so yes it's horrible but um but it's horrible in, in advance we can yeah. stop it, um, it's yeah. being able to explore the possible ramifications of technology is one of right. the more interesting things you can do with sci-fi and it's like it's not like that's even a new idea 1984 was all about the concept of newspeak which we're finding unfortunately relevant again today uh, but it's a way of starting to explore some of these ideas and and work at them and go do we want to build this future or do we want to build another future mm -hmm. and then try and come to some vague consensus of how we want to do things or at least start building up familiarity so when it happens we know how to react to it we've got about 10 minutes left so let's throw out to questions from the floor anybody have questions uh, for the panelists so is it doctor oh, wait, 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 yeah. we've got a soft box and we'll report oh. we'll pass you around 
<laughs> uh, technically, yes. Do I talk into the button? Okay. Yeah, wow, know. I've never seen this before. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, your point about freedom essentially being a limited resource, if I understood you correctly, mm. you know, I really take to heart because I have con conversations with people about rights and freedoms. And, you know, we talk a lot, a lot in this country about rights. We never seem to talk enough about responsibility. Mm. Responsibility to each other, responsibility to ourselves even. And, uh, you know, the internet being a fertile breeding ground for libertarian points of view, I wonder if you run into any, uh, any friction, any pushback when you, when you make suggestions like that. Uh, yes. Um. <laughs> so uh, the the phrase that we haven't yet hit on is the concept of when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. that's like the full key phrase to work from. Mm -hmm. Also, I'd say just from a campus point of view, if you go and listen to this this American Life story that ran in the last month or two about um, my, my effing First Amendment or something like that, you get a real baptism into how this kind of stuff is happening on college campuses where at least where Andy and I are like um, seeing it. So as a woman who works in science in public uh, I have a slightly unique perspective on this in that I have not gone a single day without a rape or a death threat for multiple years. My archive, my hate archive is just is in the thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to offer a pro tip for anyone who is, is worried about these types of things, and that's to check out the Crash Override Network. It is a really beautiful one-stop shop, uh, well, one-stop to go through guides, a little like lockdown app. It teaches you stuff to do in advance. It teaches you stuff when you're getting swarmed, and it does it in a way that you don't need to have a lot of technological background to start with. If the name sounds familiar, uh, it's because Crash Override Network is named after part of the Hackers movie. So it's an another little chunk of this concept of pop culture influencing the actual society we end up in. Uh, there's also huge, huge, huge cultural differences in how different groups uh, behave online that you can see uh, online but also in actual physical spaces and how they treat the commons. In North America there's a, a kind of um, a selfish viewpoint I'll get mine and I don't care if you get yours but if you go to somewhere like Japan it's more inclined to uh, everybody picks up the trash in a stadium afterwards and leaves with their garbage bags of junk. Uh, you can see it even inside of different European countries of really like the easiest way to see what the, the cultural perspective on common spaces is. It's either to go into the shared kitchen of an office space or go into a stadium after a performance. We have a question in the front here. Okay. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's attacking you. So some of the ideas for, oh, is it on? Yep. Okay, for how to um, deal with this overriding problem of the internet of garbage, of information <laughs> overflow, the attention economy, have to do with filtering and decentralizing. Um, and the early internet had a lot of locally managed communities, forums. Um, Clay Shirky had a really fascinating study of LiveJournal. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think happened to that? Um, and what are the obstacles to getting back to it? And what are the complications that would arise? Facebook happened to it, yeah. right? That's, That's the short answer. Twitter the happened. other answer is that, of course, nothing happened to it. It's still, a lot of it's still all there. It's doing what it was always doing. It's being weird and awesome and a bunch of it's on Tumblr. Um, but uh, I think part of what we, um, what we maybe underestimated was just how difficult it would be to like scale that and get it to talk, right? Get those different pieces to talk to each other. Um, just how much work it would be to sort of think about um, all of the sort of tricky ways algorithms would try to shape and then monetize the attention that we pay to those different spaces, right? Um, so, yeah, a lot of things. Uh, so, something that um, something that exists in physical social groups as opposed to digital groups is that it is easier to see trust networks. So, it's something of I went to school with you, I saw how you did your homework, and I trust you to be now competent in your particular field, and when now I encounter something about this field, I go and I ask you about it. Um, it, is, it is easier to see in physical real life, because those are the people you go ask for favors on things, or you, you um, go to their performances on a particular topic or anything like that. Uh, 
the same thing exists online and it, it manifests in things like um, I'm one of the v very few scientists who came out of my graduating high school class and I'm the only disaster scientist. So literally every single time there's any sort of disaster, everybody who knew me in, in high school shows up on my Facebook page being like, tell me about this volcano. Am I going to die in an earthquake? And then they take it and they pass it out and pass it out and pass it out. And it turns into these multiple degrees of connection. And then every now and then somebody comes back around that I know from a totally different <laughs> circumstance who's like, hey, I just saw on like my Aunt Mary's page you talking about volcanoes. And I'm like, great. I'm glad everybody found someone to trust in this. Um, where I think technology breaks on it is that we ha are, are currently in the process of negotiating the idea that expertise has meaning. Um, and that there, that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, and that used to be an ideal. That was something we were looking for, and now it turns out we don't actually like that. That we don't like the concepts of it, and so we're starting to build more and more towards persistent identities and the concept of verification um, and trying to attach and establish credentials. Uh, it, it, in terms of human sociology and culture, it's the idea of how do we deal with reputation networks when we have such enormous communities that you can't know everybody in it. More questions? Here? Um, yeah, I have first just a quick comment because you're a writing teacher into open source. If you know of anybody who's good at technical writing, please send them to work on actual open source projects. We need that everywhere. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the second one, I'm curious about you guys' opinion on talking about freedom and how it is with licensing. How do you feel about viral licensing that's sort of, you know, the, I mean, it's named that way for anybody who doesn't know because it infects outward from derivative works or versus like an MIT license, which is really outright take this and do whatever the hell you want with it mm -hmm. style. I always liked viral licenses because they do create a share, a, a common resource, right? And a common resource where if you take from the common resource, you have to give back, right? So if we're talking about responsibility and not just freedom, you at least have the responsibility if you're building off of something that's using the GPL or another, right, CC share alike, right, another sort of viral license, that if you're taking from this pool of stuff that people have built together, you've got to at least give back to it. Um, I haven't revisited that idea in a bunch of years, but I, I still like it. I don't know. Uh, so coming from a content creating perspective, I um, I am somewhat inclined towards. L hmm. I don't like it when people can take what I w uh, what I created and do something that I consider abhorrent with it. Mm. So I have more of an ethical framework of how I choose to license my work. And it's less about the commercial chunk of it because once I put it out there, I accept that I it it would it would take me too much time and effort to enforce anything. So I just don't care. Uh, but I do care about the moral implications and the ethical framework of it, and I include that in my licensing. This will be probably our last question. Yes. I'm sure some of you, some of these people in the room, have read. Um, 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts by Joran Lanier. Um, it, he would like to see the fake current Facebook and Twitter die because they've become so toxic. Do you know of any replacement that can grow up in a, in a better, more positive way? I think the idea of saying, hey, you should all just delete your stuff comes from a place of extreme privilege um, because that's saying that you don't need those online distributed communities for your support network. I have been in a Twitter group with the Women of Science track this entire weekend dealing with everybody having both positive and negative experiences. We are a huge little support group for each other that without Twitter we would not be able to do. Um, it's how I get most of my jobs because I live in Canada where we don't have a population or an audience base. Uh, like, there's nobody there. I can go ahead and create all I want, and I can have polar bears, and they don't have much money. Um, just try charging moose for entry. Um, so, just, and that, then that's not even getting into people who have identities that they can't expose in public, that they need to be able to have some, some sort of um, 
a persistent identity, but not a true identity. Uh, and, and how exactly we want to move that forward and how do we deal with existing platforms or try and modify and change those platforms where we don't just replicate the same problems. I think it, it is, it's, it's worth thinking about, but I think delete it all and start over is not the option, is not the answer. But the, the 2.0 has got to be different. I mean, the, the current one fail has, has been a tremendous failure. It's been a massive success for companies. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, there's like US there's no election black and white. Right, yeah. right. It's it's shades of gray. There's no black and white. It's not been a huge failure or a huge success. It's just been a huge difference and a huge change. And I'm saying this as somebody who's literally got thousands of pieces of hate mail. Like, and I'm still saying there are net positives for me that it is worth it. I mean. I, I've had stalkers now for 15 years, and it's still worth it. So I wouldn't say it's a, a hard positive or a hard negative. It's great. It's just like all of humanity. Everything is complicated. Uh, I also think the idea of replace the platform very much kind of over overlooks the moment of history we're in, right? We were in a moment of history 10 years ago where platforms were being replaced every 10 minutes, right? There was a friend turned on a MySpace, then a Facebook, and now there's still Facebook, and there's been Facebook, right? Eventually, platforms mature, their network effects bake in their advantage, and so we're unlikely to blow the thing up and build a new one. We're probably gonna have to think about how we regulate, right? How we set rules and responsibilities about the extant platforms to get them to, to behave in a more reasonable manner. That's all the time we have for today. If you didn't get a program at the beginning of the panel, um, you can come grab one and learn more about the conference, including how to submit an abstract uh, for next year. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers. Yeah.